and also some of the really amazing research work that Betsy does with um, amphibians around uh, North Carolina. So we'll go ahead and start our slideshow. And all right, so here we are again, other pictures of us. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so first and foremost, if you've been to the North Carolina Zoo, um, go, ahead, go ahead and throw it in the chat. Um, if you haven't, we're right in the middle of the state. Um, we're run by the North Carolina state government and um, we are 500 acres, but we're going to talk about some other more than 500 acres actually that we have. Um, Betsy will talk about that in a second. But today we're talking um, a lot about amphibians and kind of like their awesomeness and how we research and learn about them. So first, of course, we wanna make sure that we understand, everybody understands what an amphibian is when we talk about an amphibian. So a um, couple of quick things, they are vertebrates, they do have backbones, um, they are ectothermic. So cold-blooded is kind of the other word that we can use for that. Um, ectothermic meaning outside temperature, ecto and therm. Um, and then they will lay their eggs in water or on land. They don't have a shell on their eggs, just kind of that gelatinous mess that um, they lay. Um, and then one of the coolest things about them, I think, is this double life that they have. So they go through metamorphosis. They have, depending on the type of animal, they have kind of different types of metamorphosis. But all in all, um, egg to some sort of larval form um, and then they'll turn into their adult basically. Um, and one of the other cool things about them is that specialized skin that they have. It's really thin skin and it's permeable. So it's able to kind of take in water. Um, they can extract oxygen through it, um, through the water as well, through their skin. And all of these things make an amphibian an amphibian. So. Does anybody know the types of amphibians that we have? See if we can get audience participation. <laughs> we'll help out. Throw one out for you, frogs. Frogs, yes, very, very good. Um, this is also gonna give me a second to bring out some of these animals because we thought it would also be fun to show some of them as well. So yeah, salamanders uh, in the chat. Awesome, yeah. Salamanders. Does anybody know like kind of the last group? The weird group. Very cool group though. Would it be the newts? Not the newts, good guess. They kind of go with the salamanders. Give it like five more seconds, then we'll move on. Okay, I'm probably gonna butcher this. Uh at axolotls oh axolotls <laughs> axolotls no. there we go yeah they are they're in the salamander and newt family all right we'll get there we'll keep it a surprise so there is um kind of like an extra group that's pretty neat but first and foremost frogs and toads um so they are the ones that are known for those kind of long back legs they're adapted for jumping or hopping so usually their front legs are more reduced um you see that in in most animals that jump or hop, like bunnies and kangaroos, longer back legs, shorter front legs. Um, they have no tail, especially in their adult stage. <laughs> they do technically when they are um, a tadpole. Uh, external fertilization, and then the way that um, we usually say it is all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. So they are um, very closely related. And one of the main, when people try to talk about the difference between frogs and toads. There's a lot of things that we throw out there, like their skin or um, kind of their shape. They're more like squat, but um, it's you can't really tell the difference very easily. Um, uh, some look more toadish and are technically frogs. Uh, the easiest way that I've learned to tell them apart is um, looking at their eggs. So frogs tend to lay eggs in a giant mass while toads lay in a long string, basically. And we have, I'm gonna stop this for a second because I wanna show you my friend. We have my friend right here. And this is actually one of those um, frogs that kind of looks like a toad. Let's see if we can get close enough so there isn't a, there's gonna of course be a glare, but can you see him? So this is a Carolina gopher frog. 
And it is technically a frog, but it does look a lot like a toad. Let me see if I can get a better glare. And we're actually going to talk about this um, friend in a second. Two. No, no glare all over. <laughs> all right. So we said toads and <laughs> things. Yes, I agree, Renee. Um, very, very adorable. Sorry that there's a glare. <laughs> um, so our second group was salamanders and newts that we said so these friends have tails um they're like lizard shaped and sorry as i move too <laughs> um, they are lizard shaped so they're the ones that a lot of times people um when they see it they think it's a lizard um, except they have that special skin and not the scales they have internal fertilization um so newts go with salamanders, so it's the same type of thing. All newts are salamanders, not all salamanders are newts. Um, but newts are kind of cool because in their life cycle, they have this um, this stage that's called an eft, which if you like um, if you like Scrabble, it's a really great Scrabble word that I use all the time. <laughs> that and Zoea, which is the larval version of a crab, great uh, Scrabble <laughs> choices. Um, and then one of the really cool things about them is actually North Carolina has a ton of species of salamanders and newts. Um, we have like the most species of salamanders in the United States. So it's a really great place. North Carolina is a really great place to do salamander research. So, uh, And I do have a friend and this one I can bring out so there shouldn't be a glare. Um, but I do have a friend with me. Anybody want to guess what type of salamander I have? It's not on that page, I will tell you that. Any thoughts? Got a guess for a tiger? Tiger, good guess. No, not a tiger. This is one of my favorites, I think. Ever since we started working with it, I've really enjoyed it, so. Um, so you'll see actually as I'm doing this, I'm kind of like, um, cause it, they do have that special skin. I'm putting on gloves and then I'm also using reverse osmosis water to kind of keep my hands nice and um, wet for them. So that special skin, definitely want to keep it protected. So any other thoughts of what animal we could have? Want to guess marbled? Marbled, very close. Does anybody know why the marbled salamander is a special salamander in North Carolina? Isn't it the state salamander? Or it is the state. Yeah, it's the state salamander. So, um, yeah, I gotta guess for a slimy slime salamander. Slimy, slime. not a slimy salamander. There's so many we could choose from, right? Because we said North Carolina has the most species in the United States. So um, I have this friend right here. I'm gonna get up and get really close to it. Let's see, can you see it? Does anybody know what this one is? Spotted, spotted. yeah, good job. <laughs> good job, friends. Yeah, this is a spotted <laughs> salamander. This is forest, forest stump. <laughs> Great name, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yes, has that um, kind of lizard shape. This is a pretty kind of common size, I would say. Uh, somewhat large, I don't know. Would you say somewhat large or pretty? It's marbled salamander size, yeah. Medium size, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We have lots of really small ones. <laughs> Thank you. That The punny name was a great one. Um, and then spotted because it has these large yellow spots and they are kind of like in two lines down its back, basically, so. Yeah. Okay, so salamanders and dupes of our other groups. And then anybody still want to try what the last group is? <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, does the reverse osmosis um, just not contain any minerals? So yeah, it's like the cleanest you can kind of get for water. And so it just kind of extracts everything that you can out of it. I don't know exactly the whole process. I don't know. Do you know the whole process of reverse osmosis? I forget the details. Yeah, <laughs> it's just kind of like the cleanest that we can kind of get, basically. Um, 
All right, so you ready to meet that last group? All right, these friends. Has anybody ever seen anything like this thing before? <laughs> So I didn't actually know that these existed until I first until I started working at the zoo. So um, these are Sicilians, um, and they're limbless. They look like giant worms. Um, they have either a really short tail or no tail at all. They're tropical species, and uh, they have internal fertilization. But they are interesting looking things, right? <laughs> they do have little tiny eyes. You can kind of see. Um, at the top where there kind of looks like a different color that is, um, I don't know if y'all can see my, oh, that is not what I meant to do, sorry. Um, my cursor, but like right here is that mouth. And they actually have lots of sharp pointy teeth as well. So um, absolutely terrifying. But mostly a lot of them are relatively small. Uh, there are some that are larger, but. All right, so why are amphibians important? Uh, these are kind of the four main kind of that I put together for why amphibians are important. So biodiversity, their food web, um, pest control, and indicator species. So to quickly kind of go through that with biodiversity, it supports healthy ecosystems. Um, it kind of creates a robust, stable eco ecosystem, which makes it more resilient. So if like a disease or a natural disaster were to kind of go through that area, um, it'd be more likely not to take out uh, the whole entire ecosystem, the more different species that are in there. Um, the food web, so they're really important in the food web because the food web is um, all about balance. Everything's interconnected basically. Um, so that equilibrium that's in there. And if one part breaks, then it kind of can, upheave the, it can cause upheaval in the whole entire ecosystem basically um, and that makes it less stable so um, food web helps with resilience as well our pest control once again that equilibrium everything in perfect balance if there's too much of one animal then that can kind of destroy the whole entire ecosystem or if there's not enough of it then um, another animal may not be able to survive because that's its food um, so pest control specifically also helps with that disease mitigation. A lot of these animals eat inverts that carry a lot of really nasty diseases um, that can affect other animals, but can also affect humans. And so they're really important at um, keeping the level of those animals at a more manageable kind of level in the environment. And then indicator species. So our indicator species is an organism whose kind of presence or absence measures the health of the area it lives in. So we were talking about how amphibians have that really special skin. Um, they are usually the ones to kind of get sick and die off when something's wrong with the environment. So if we're able to kind of watch the levels of those amphibians and research them, we, then we can tell a lot about the health of their environment. Um, and um, yeah, that's special since the special sin can take anything in its body, then if there's like pollutions or just general changes in like salinity or um, pH or something like that, then it can it can cause them to to get sick, basically. Before I move on, do we anybody have any quick questions about that? Because I'm going to turn it over to my friend in a second. Mm. <laughs> I've been talking a lot, sorry. <laughs> All right, so we learned what an amphibian is, met some fun friends, why they're important. So how do we help amphibians? I'm going to pass it over to um, Betsy for that. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. You can move it up to you, too. <laughs> OK. Um, so I, um, I'm like the zoo's unofficial wildlife biologist. So I, I basically manage all the zoo's land and I also um, I work on research projects um, at the zoo and in other places in North Carolina. Um, and so we help amphibians in numerous ways. Uh, the first way is just by preserving land. Um, and then there's um, a couple other specific projects that we are working on to help um, certain species that are in trouble. So um, I'll tell you more about some of those details. Uh, so the North Carolina Zoo has over 2,000 acres of land that's protected for wildlife. So none of that land is developed. Uh, some of it is right um, around the zoo. And then we also have a couple larger properties that are within about 20 miles of the zoo. 
Um, and since um, most of the amphibians that occur on our land um, need water for part of their life cycle. So we have um, on our land, we have large lakes, we have small ponds, we have streams, um, we have permanent ponds, we have ephemeral ponds, which are really important for some species. Um, and our land provides really good habitat for, um, for a lot of amphibians and other species as well, not just amphibians. Um, and so we do surveys uh, for some of these species regularly um, on our land, um, especially the ones that breed in ephemeral ponds, since their um, their life cycles are very much tied to the weather and you can find them at certain um, times of the year. So we'll survey um, for adults and for eggs and for larvae. So um, I'll tell you about just a couple of those species um, that I think are interesting and I especially like to work with. Um, so this one that we just met, um, the spotted salamander, um, that's one of the most common ones to see um, in the Piedmont and in the mountain areas of North Carolina. Um, they're pretty good size, uh, chunky, medium-sized salamander. They're black. They have uh, large yellow to orangish spots running down their back. Um, and they spend almost the entire year underground. Um, so they, they can dig burrows. And they are um, under logs, under rocks, and you're very unlikely to see them. But um, when it's time to breed, then they all come out. Um, so in early spring, when we get those big rains, um, that's when all the salamanders emerge from their burrows and they head uh, to the femoral ponds to breed. So these ponds are dry for most of the year, but when they fill up with water, the salamanders all migrate there um, to meet up and to lay eggs. Um, so on the, on the right side of this slide, you can see um, that's me holding an egg mass. So um, one female can lay um, a big mass like that, which can have um, like up to 500 eggs. Um, if you look closely, you can see some of the larvae that are actually developing inside those eggs that haven't hatched yet. And then once they hatch, uh, they'll develop in the pond for a couple of months and then they'll metamorphose and leave um, around the time that the pond dries. Uh, and then they'll they'll head up into the land and they won't come back um, to the water until they're ready to breed. All right, so the marbled salamander is another cool one that I like to work with. Um, another interesting one. Um, and like Leslie said, this one is our state salamander. <laughs> and it occurs throughout the entire state. Um, like the spotted salamander, it is also um, pretty specific about the time when they come out and when they breed. Um, but this one actually breeds in fall rather than spring. So they're they're black and white, kind of a uh, blotchy mottled pattern like that, a little bit smaller than the spotted salamander. And um, so they will come out in fall and they will lay their eggs, they'll mate and lay their eggs um, near the edges of the pond or in the, the bottom of the, basically the dry pond. So um, they'll lay their eggs uh, underneath logs. So on this, you can see on the right side of the slide, you can see there's a bunch of eggs there if you look closely. They kind of blend in with the mud. But I found these salamanders underneath a log. So I lifted it up um, and I found the salamanders, I found the eggs. Um, so they actually lay their eggs when there's no water and the females will stay with the eggs um, until the rains come and fill up the ponds with water. So as soon as the water um, basically submerges the eggs, they'll hatch and then they'll swim off um, and develop. So um, it's just, a, it's a really cool thing um, that's different from other salamanders um, that occur around here. So it's neat to see, and that's, that's actually in the Zooland, it's the first time I've ever seen that before. I've heard that they do that, um, but that's really neat to see. <laughs> okay, another one specific species that we like to help um, is the gopher frog. And the gopher frog has a special place in my heart. Uh, I, my my first research project that I ever did was with gopher frogs um, during my master's degree, and I've since worked with uh, gopher frogs in Mississippi and now in North Carolina. And um, they're just they're really really cool species. Um, they are threatened in North Carolina. Uh, they've declined uh, throughout their range uh, because their habitat has been altered and destroyed. Uh, they're found in longleaf pine savannas, and um, Kind of like the salamanders, they um, they breed in ephemeral ponds, you know, during the winter and early spring mainly. Um, but they spend most of their lives in stump holes and burrows um, that are can be quite far from the pond. So some of these frogs will move, you know, over a mile or two um, to get from their burrow to the pond. And a lot of times they'll go back to the same burrows. Uh, 
Um, so we are at the zoo. We are head starting gopher frogs, which means that um, we are collecting eggs from the wild. We're raising them at the zoo and then releasing um, the newly metamorphosed frogs into back into the wild habitat. And so by doing that, we're able to help more more of the frogs survive than would have naturally. So, you know, if these eggs were developing in the pond, um, you know, there's predators that could eat them. Um, the pond may dry up. Um, there's a lot of things, you know, that would reduce their survival. So um, by raising them at the zoo, we're helping more of them survive. And so there's more, you know, hopefully out there in the environment that are surviving to um, adulthood and then reproducing. So this is one of the breeding ponds um, where we're releasing frogs and hope to one day collect the eggs from. Uh, so this shows some of the egg masses that we've collected from the pond. Um, each of these buckets has a portion of uh, an individual egg mass laid by a female. Uh, so we keep them each in separate buckets um, until the eggs hatch. And then um, we mix up the tadpoles and put them into, into these big, large uh, cattle tanks. And so we put um, some of the eggs in each one in case something happens to one of the tanks, then at least, you know, some of its brothers and sisters, um, you know, can survive and in, in some of the other tanks. Um, so we had 12 tanks that we raised this year. And um, inside the tanks is rainwater. So we just like open them, let them fill with water um, naturally. And there's also some maiden cane grass inside, which is what normally um, occurs in their um, in their breeding ponds in nature. So we collect some of the uh, grass and we dry it out and then we put it um, inside uh, the tank. So it's, you know, mimics a uh, natural pond. And so if you look inside, this is what you would see. This is a, a gopher frog swimming in the water and you can see the grass that's um, on the bottom there. And after a couple of months, the tadpoles start sprouting legs and they will start reabsorbing their tail. So this one um, has about probably another week to go before he loses his tail. Um, so during that time, the tadpoles are feeding, uh, they're swimming around, they're eating a lot of algae that grows naturally. We also supplement that with algae wafers just to make sure that they have enough. And then once the tadpoles have um, gotten all four limbs and lost their tails, we uh, release them. Uh, back into the their natural habitat. So here's a frog that we um, just released uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, our, our last frogs finally um, emerged from the ponds. So this year we raised about uh, 450, which is the most that we've ever done. Um, so in the last five years, I think we it's but there's about 1500 frogs that we've released uh, into the wild. And so here's uh, me and one of my colleagues uh, releasing those frogs. All right, so another species that we work with is the hellbender. Uh, hellbender is another super cool species that has lots of fun nicknames. Uh, my favorite is the snot otter. Uh, what's your favorite? I love lasagna lizard. Lasagna lizard, because that's a good one. Because since they have the little like weird things on their side and that I think it's cool because then you can talk about how they have those so they can absorb all this extra water and then they don't even have to use their lungs. They have lungs, but they're like, I don't even need these because they <laughs> can just absorb all this extra oxygen through water through my skin. <laughs> anyway. <Right. laughs> yeah. So they can breathe through their skin, which is cool. Um, they're very slimy, which is why they're called a snot otter. Um, so these salamanders live their entire lives in the water. They're fully aquatic. They are um, they are in trouble. They're a species of special concern in North Carolina. Um, so they normally live in large, clear, fast flowing rivers um, that are very healthy, that have um, a lot of oxygen and um, a lot of big rocks. So they shelter under large rocks. Um, that's where they lay their eggs and that's where they live most of their lives. So. If they don't have large rocks or if the rocks get filled up um, like by by siltation or um, you know if there's pollution or um, if people are in some places people are over collecting them um, and populations are declining that way um, uh, so those are yeah the main things causing them to decline um, so we are helping hellbenders by creating more homes for them so here's a picture 
of them here. So these are Hellbender nest boxes. Um, they're made out of concrete and they're basically designed to be the perfect size and shape uh, for a Hellbender. So if a Hellbender finds this thing, they think, wow, this is the best home yeah. I could ever I could ever find. Um, so there's there's one hole that's in the the bottom side of it. So we uh, when we place that in the river, that is actually facing downstream, which is the way they like it to be. And that also prevents it from filling up with silt um, and making it uninhabitable uh, for a hellbender. So we go out to rivers and we put these, um, we just place them in the water. Uh, we put rocks around them. We may, you try to camouflage them and um, you know, make it look like it's it's part of the natural habitat so people don't find them and so the hellbenders um you know will see it as part of their their natural habitat and then uh, we go out regularly and do surveys so uh the top of the box actually has um a little lid on it so you could lift it up and look inside to see if a hellbender is there we also have a camera that we can stick um inside the hole and look for hellbenders as well so we can see if any of them are being used we can um, catch the hellbenders. We can mark them and see if um, we've caught them before. If we have, we can see how far they've moved. Um, and so it helps us um, understand how well the hellbenders are doing and to learn more about their ecology, which can help us, you know, better help them in the future. Here's a pretty good size one. This is what we hope to find every time we go and do surveys. They're like two footers, right? Yeah. <laughs> And you can see some of that extra skin that they have on their sides that Leslie was talking about the, <laughs> the lasagna portion yes. of the hellbender. <laughs> I think it's a funny name. Uh, another one that I've heard of is uh, Allegheny alligator too. So that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, ex one of the, best yeah. Ones, okay. the extra skin, it's extra surface air for them to absorb oxygen. So it just helps them breathe better. Huh? And both, so both gopher frogs and hellbenders are, they're really hard to find in the wild. Uh, consider yourself lucky if you've ever seen one. Um, but if you're not that lucky, you can come to the zoo and see them. So we do display both of these species. Um, the gopher frog can be found in the cypress swamp exhibit and the hellbender is in our streamside exhibit. And we actually do have one of our uh, hellbender nest boxes inside the exhibit. So it's in the kind of in the bottom right side of the um, the picture. You can see it there and it's it's cut cut open on one side. So if you come, um, you can usually see one in there using it. So. Yeah, there's like almost always one in there. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, they're really hard to see, even if you know what you're looking for, because they just look like exactly like a rock basically mm -hmm. super camouflage yes. <laughs> yeah and the gopher frog there's a little a little burrow that that one's usually in so um you can kind of see it there cool okay so i think that's it um are there any questions about any of that i can answer not yet okay not yet. yeah throw All it right. in the chat if you want so um, all right, I'll turn it back over to Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work on this together. So, all right. So, yes, these things are awesome. We do a lot of stuff here at the zoo, but also I'm sure you all want to know how you can help um, these amazing animals since they're so important to the ecosystem and they're also just stinking cute and amazing and we love them. Um, and so there's quite a few ways that you can help. One of those is kind of community science, um, citizen science, uh, same type of thing. Um, iNaturalist is a really great app. Uh, you can take any pictures of any amphibians that you see and put it on iNaturalist, and then it helps researchers kind of know what's going on at what, in what places. Um, just an overall fun app. If anybody has it, I'm sure you can attest to that. It's a great, great app. Um, another one is Frog Watch USA. So Frog Watch USA is through the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Um, and it's a really fun way to be able to help scientists, but also learn all the um, frogs that are in your backyard um, or near where you live. And we're going to do a little bit of it. So um, I'm going to move this real quick because I'm going to have to use my computer or use my phone. But um, so what we're going to do is kind of how Frog Watch USA works. You actually do have to go through training, um, become trained. So if you want to do it, you can um, Google Frog Watch USA and then find a local chapter where you can do training. Um, 
and you learn the frog calls of the frogs in your environment right around where you live and then you have to go out and listen and then you mark down all the frogs that you hear basically so um, one thing that's really neat about frogs is that they all have different calls and you can id them based on their calls even if you can't see them so does anybody happen to know what frog this is though let's see if we we got some frog id skills this is one that was really hard for me. And then and then Betsy told me how to tell it apart from another one the other day, and it's been really easy ever since. <laughs> I don't know what this is, but we had a question in the chat about the spotted salamanders. OK, um, so uh, they see they heard that spotted salamanders have algae in their egg and in their bodies that help them feed helps feed the eggs through photosynthesis. Is this true? Yeah, that is true. Um, in fact, you can see it um, often with an egg. And if you look at an egg mass, you can see there's, um, you know, like the eggs look green um, around the embryo. And there is like a symbiotic relationship that the eggs have um, with uh, certain types of algae. And so that helps um, oxygenate um, the eggs until they, until they hatch, basically. So I forgot to mention that, but that is that's a really cool thing that um, I believe only spotted salamanders do that. At least I've never heard of another species doing that. I so don't even know that. So. At least, at least, <laughs> I mean, maybe somewhere in the world there is, but in North Carolina, like it's only spotted salamanders that do that. So very cool. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm learning today too. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> All right, awesome. any thoughts what this one is? So we got a guess for a green frog. Yes, green frog. Very good. Um, I used to have a really hard time with green frogs and bullfrogs when they were roughly around the same size. And um, Betsy told me to look for this nice ridge right here. Um, green frogs have that and uh, bullfrogs do not. So thank you for that, Betsy. This is why mm -hmm. we have the expert with us. Um, does anybody know what, uh, so what we'll do is we'll play the green frog call. And then if y'all can tell us what you think it sounds like, okay? If it'll work. Come on. And so this, the website that I'm using is um, USGS Frog Calls. Um, and it's a really great website. It has like every frog that you could possibly imagine. And it, of course, isn't working right now, as I've just talked about how wonderful and great it is. Does anybody happen to know what the green frog sounds like? I kind of had to equate it to something. All right, I'm going to play it. Any thoughts what? What do you think that sounds like? So part of the thing that's great about Frog Watch USA is like you can use your own descriptions of it because that's how you're going to be able to remember it better. What do you think of? All right, I think of, I can tell you what I think of. I think of rubber bands. I used to have like when you used to have a tissue box and you put rubber bands over it and you just pluck, pluck the, <laughs> the mm -hmm. rubber bands. That's what I think of. So it kind of sounds like a rubber band to me. Um, so green frog, rubber band, basically. This is um, a chorus frog. And here is what chorus frogs sound like. So for the green frog, we had another person suggest chicken clucking. Chicken clucking. So that one's hard because there's actually another one that I think more sounds like chickens. It's the wood frog. OK, hold on. Uh, that one is hard. And the only reason I know this is because um, I had to learn a wood frog for another one. I think the frown sounds more like quacking. <laughs> yeah, I can hear the way that I described it. The way that I described it to somebody else was it sounded like um, a bunch of things clucking like um, several like houses over. So it's like a muffled, 
it's like a bunch of them in one area, but it's muffled. So, but like I said, whatever works for you. So yeah, it, it does. I can kind of hear mm-hmm. that as well, for sure. And some people say banjo, you know, it sounds like oh, you're yeah. plucking a banjo string or a, maybe a guitar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So chorus frog. We have several on this one. We're going to go with Upland. What does that sound like to you? Any thoughts? This one, when somebody first said it to me, I cannot think of anything else afterwards. Would you mind playing that again? I didn't hear it when you played it the first time. Yeah, still not really hearing anything for it. Um, oh, no. I don't know if well, it's the volume's too low or if, the, if it's just the between the uh, phone sound to the audio from the computer. If that's maybe, because we heard the first one, right? Yeah, maybe it's just that frequency. It doesn't maybe. pick up. So it sounds kind of like, um, have you ever taken like a plastic comb and run your fingers up and down it? It's kind of like a clink, 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 clink um, noise. Mm-hmm. And that one was hard too because in the background there were some other frogs as well. And this one is um, this is like the first one you'll hear in spring. So chorus frogs are generally the first frogs to start calling. So I always get excited when I hear them because it means spring is coming. <laughs> spring is spring yeah. is somewhat sprung. Mm-hmm. All right. So this one actually this is does anybody know what this one is? This uh this little adorable little friend. You look close, you might see an X on its back. That's a clue. That is its clue. I know this one from its noise. I think this is probably one that a lot of people hear. We've got a spring peeper. Spring peeper, mm-hmm. great job, yeah. So there are your peepers. Can you all hear that? Maybe. It's very faint, but I'm sort very of here. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happening, friends. Um, so yeah, spring peeper. Um, it has that peep, 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 peeper, peeper. And as they're really high pitched, they're the ones that I usually hear first. And I guess I don't hear the uplands very much, but um, I usually hear them second. But okay, yeah, so at least you. in my house. But but <laughs> and it's another early spring one, yeah. so. Those are the two species that you're most likely to hear. And they're tiny, tiny, tiny little things. Um, all right. This one is the one that I used to get it um, mix, mistaken for. So this is your um, American bullfrog. Um, this is one that I saved because it was in an area where it couldn't get anywhere. So I had to pick it up and save it. Um, but American bullfrogs, I think, is probably what a lot of people think of when they think of frogs. They have that, like, woo. Mm, Ooh, that really deep um, noise. They've also been known to um, make a funny little like, if they get excited, then they kind of go like, <laughs> that's how I can describe it because clearly my <laughs> my uh, my phone isn't working anymore. Um, but um, so they have the really deep booming sound basically. All right, we have one more. This one is hard to see. Because they have such amazing camouflage, right? Does anybody happen to know? This one, I, I still have a really hard time with identifying it. Um, but it's one of my favorites to hear. So we actually hear this one around the zoo a lot. This is a cricket frog. Um, and so it so, sounds a lot like a cricket, a lot of people say. Um, but I actually think it sounds like um, sleigh bells when there's a lot of them. It sounds like kind of sleigh bells in the background. I'm going to play it and see if it works, but probably not, right? <laughs> I think it sounds like marbles clacking together. That is that is one of my other ones, yeah. too. When it's just one, it sounds like the marbles mm-hmm. clacking together. Um, yeah, marbles clicking are mine. I always tell people, like, you hear the 
bag of marble shaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can hear that, but <laughs> it's a lot of noise at once too. <laughs> Um, but the this USGS um, frog call website is a really great website if you want to learn all of the frogs that are kind of around you. Um, you can look it up based off of North Carolina specifically. It doesn't necessarily break it down to if you're in the mountains or the Piedmont or the coast, but um, you can kind of learn who's around you and then use that to figure out what you think their noises sound like. And um, that'll help you ID identify them a lot easier. So Frog Watch is a lot of fun. Um, and um, so yeah. All right, so, so those are kind of like two big community or citizen science um, programs that you can participate in, but kind of how we were talking about some of those other um, ways that we help the uh, we help like the salamanders with um, all those giant rocks and stuff like that um, that or we were talking about how it's important to them leaving rocks and logs be a lot of those friends all of our amphibian friends they like to live where there's lots of rocks big rocks or in fallen logs um we other ways that you can help is by refraining from using pesticides and chemicals especially in your yard because even if it's in your yard it still can get runoff and down into an area that can affect an amphibian um, keeping pets on a leash and away from their habitats pets can be very curious um i have a dog that i live with that loves to try to eat toads um, we have toads in their backyard all the time so we have to kind of watch her um, with that so yeah keeping pets kind of close and at least away from those habitats those animals still are found. Um, and then taking the information that you learned today and talking to other people is incredibly powerful with anything, sharing what you know with other people, um, telling them all the fun, cool things that we do at the zoo and, and then maybe one day coming to the zoo and seeing all these animals here as well. And then supporting organizations and policies that kind of help amphibians and their habitats as well is very important. So um that is does anybody have any questions we said we ended a little bit early but any questions for us if you so right here if you, if you want to contact us um here is our information we'll leave it up for a second but feel free to throw any questions you have in the chat there's also um there should be a mic up towards the top right hand of your screen or a raised hand um you can use any of those to to throw out your questions So uh, let's see, any interesting info you have on the pickerel frog? Um, they're around and I love them. <laughs> I don't have any specific interesting stuff about pickerel frogs. Have you ever worked with them or? No, they're another common one. Um, yeah, they have, have uh, rows of spots down their back. Um, Generally occur in, yeah, similar habitats that you'd find like bullfrogs okay. or green frogs. Um, yeah, permanent bodies of water. Um, I have a picture of one. Do you? Yeah. So these pictures are actually, when I was looking for pictures, um, these are pictures that I took from iNaturalist. So, um, so this is a pickerel right here. And I don't remember what they sound like, so that is one I did did learn, but um, I don't remember mm -hmm. the girl. So what are y'all's favorite? Oh, there's amphibian? Go ahead. What's your favorite amphibian? What's our? Uh, what is your mm -hmm. favorite amphibian? Do you have a favorite amphibian? Oh, I I have hard. a hard time. Yeah, <laughs> I usually say gopher frog just because I've worked with them for so long. Um, you know, they've just always been a part of my life. And yeah, I love that. Um, so gopher frogs, they're very, um, you know, they find their burrow and they often will like stay there and go back there year after year and, you know, live in it for a long time. And you can see them, if you go out there and actually find one, um, you can see them sitting right outside um, the burrow at night um, looking for bugs. So, and even during the day when they're inside, you can see a little spot where they've um, they've cleared off uh, the grass and leaves and stuff. And it looks like just a little pad. And 
So if you see one of those, you know, by a stump hole in an area where there might be gopher frogs, you know that, you know, that one's probably occupied. So that's one of my favorite things about them. If you put some leaves there, they'll like clear it off again because they want to keep their little spot clean. Um, you know, and I just, I just think it's cool that they, they move so far and they're so specific to the habitats that they live in, both longleaf pine forests um, and um, stump holes. And in other parts of the their range, they're very specific to gopher frog, or sorry, gopher tortoise burrows. Um, they'll also use crayfish burrows and mammal burrows as well. So they don't dig their own burrows, but they use the burrows of other animals. So they have this relationship um, with their habitat and with the other animals that dig the burrows. And I think it's just a, a really good example of how all the different parts of the ecosystem, you know, really work together. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's my favorite and why. What's yours? <laughs> I have lots. Um... I kind of, I tend to have favorites of like each type of any animal that I'm ever asked. So um, I do actually really love axolotls. Um, I think they're really cool. They're one of the first amphibians that I really got into because of the gills and just how different they are looking and they're just cool little animals. Um, but I, I really, I really love Forrest Stump. He's just the cutest <laughs> little thing in the world so um I've really grown to like spotted salamanders because of working with forest um and frogs is also a hard one I really love like almost every type of frog um but um let's see if I had to pick one one of the coolest is the wood frog um because it can actually like freeze and then unfreeze. And so it lives in much cooler areas and because of that can survive in temperatures that a lot of other frogs can't live in. And so that is just really neat to think of that a frog literally can like freeze itself <laughs> and then survive. So they are pretty neat. Um, yeah. Uh, so we had a question come up in the chat is, have you had any especially exciting amphibian sightings in your air area recently? I haven't had any. No. Um, I don't. I don't think so. Not. Nothing unexpected. Um. Yeah, I get. I'll keep thinking. <laughs> I wish I, I wish I could say yes. <laughs> True, right? It's like I wish. Um, I mean, I, I will say, um, you know, we were talking about Sicilians earlier, um, and they, so they occur in tropical areas. They're in South America, Africa, Southeast Asia, but we don't have them um, in North America. But uh, recently, they were just found invasive in Florida, and I would say that's that's probably not a good thing. Um, but I guess it's unexpected and maybe exciting <laughs> to know that we actually we do have all three um, orders of yeah, amphibians in the U.S. now. Um, yeah, hopefully they're not firmly established. But um, that was something I, I heard in the news just a couple weeks ago. The most common amphibians that I see, I don't see a lot of salamanders um, around the zoo. Um, but we have like right behind us is kid zone, which is kind of the giant play area that we have. And there's a pond in there. Um, and we get a lot of green frogs and a lot of, um, bullfrogs there too, mostly green frogs. And then any time that I see a tree frog, it's like the happiest time of my life. Cause they're just so cute and I love them. So we have a lot of green tree frogs and a lot of Cope's gray tree frogs mm -hmm. around here as well. Um, but um, the pickerel, that picture of that pickerel, I've only ever, so most of, a lot, I will always hear, um, I will always hear peepers, and I will always hear and see cricket frogs, and green frogs, and bullfrogs, so the first time I saw the pickerel around here was a really, a really cool one, so um, it's not one that I see very often, so. I also love Chelsea says, I feel attached to Forrest Stump after this presentation. <laughs> just too cute right <laughs> oh forest is so great yeah that was a, a super fun little uh name that we had a full-time staff member that retired last year and by the at around the time that she retired we also got the salamander and so we gave her naming rights and she came up with that name and it's probably one of the best names of any of the animals that we have so <laughs> We, we had a really amazing experience the other day. We were going in and out of the back door at night and 
I saw a green tree frog who likes to hang around our back door anyway. But I looked down and his throat was lit up. And I was yeah. like, oh my God. I called, called David and I said, come quick, come quick. See, this frog is lighting up. For some reason, this frog is lighting up. It didn't really occur to me. And it happened a couple of times. And then we realized he had eaten a uh, firefly. Mm-hmm. But his throat was like, yeah. <laughs> No, it wasn't. It wasn't going out like an animal, but it was like, yeah. what's happening here? I'm, I'm, you oh, know, I'm hallucinating. I'm glad it wasn't a light, like a like a no, Christmas no. light or something like that. Like, <laughs> times and then the uh, the uh, lightning bug expired. I'm afraid, but it was pretty amazing. It was it was really quite cool. I have seen videos and photos of that, but I've never seen that in person. Me so either. that's that's pretty cool. You got to see that. Yeah, it was really neat. I appreciate I've also appreciate seen pictures. Fun. I've also seen pictures um, in Florida of uh, tree frogs uh, trying to eat Christmas lights, and so they're that's what that's yeah. actually why that's what I thought of too, because I'm sure that's the exact picture. Yeah, that just, I mean, they don't actually eat it; they you know just kind of chew. They it just kind of like yeah, gnaw yeah. on it a little yeah. bit. <laughs> <laughs> the same type of thing, though. I didn't even think lightning bugs. I was like, it has to be a light. Oh right, there are, but <laughs> there is bioluminescence. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions or anything? So I do have a question about the gopher frog um since they live in longleaf pine habitat and that's known to be a fire dependent habitat how do the gopher frogs like how are they adapted to survive do they just hide in their burrow or uh yeah most of the time they're in their burrows they also um so I was I was actually radio tracking some frogs um, for a couple of months, um, and there was a prescribed burn that took place during my study, and um, I was a little worried about my frogs, and so so was everyone else. Um, but I was also excited to see you know how they responded to the fire, and some of them um, went into their burrows, of course, which is what you would expect. Um, but some of them went to the pond, which still was a little bit moist and it didn't burn all the way through. Um, and some of them actually moved um, to areas that weren't burning. So probably during the fire, they were hopping along and actually managed to like outrun it and find, um, you know, some patchy areas. So that's why it's it's really important, you know, when we do prescribe burns that you don't just char everything, you know, black, you know, like a natural fire would burn you know, in a patchy way, and there would be, you know, little refuges for the animals. And so, you know, that's just an example of my study that, you know, those areas really, really are important. That's cool. Yeah, I'm familiar with longleaf pine forests and prescribed burns. I was curious as what they did when a burn comes through. Um, mm-hmm. It was like, I'm just gonna go hide in the pond, I'm gonna dive in my burrow, or <laughs> just run. <laughs> yeah. All of the above. <laughs> and, and the times of years when we have have the most fires, um, you know, typically in summer when there's a lot of lightning, that's that's generally not a time that they're moving. So the adults um, are typically in their burrows and juveniles are done migrating at that point. So they've found a burrow. So, um, you know, they're unlikely to be to be out, you know, in the open without a refuge nearby. So I think that also helps them. And then with the help of their homes, will you find more than one in a home or is it like a, are they territorial and that like, this is my home, you can't come in here? They're pretty territorial. Um, yeah, it's typically just one. I'm just imagining a hellbender trying to protect its thing. Just like. <laughs> oh, they're aggressive. They they defend them, um, <laughs> especially during the nesting season. You know, if they find a good one, you know, for the eggs, like yeah. they're going to. They're going to fight off any other hellbender that tries to use it because like I was saying earlier, it's, you know, it's the perfect, it's the, the perfect home. So they definitely want to fight that one off. Um, you know, so, so we try to put out as many boxes as we can, you know, so that every hellbender can find a good home. <laughs> one of my favorite things about hellbenders is not, te- I guess not technically about them, but um, they are the, they're the largest species of salamander in North Carolina or North America, but um, that they're related to the Chinese and Japanese giant salamanders. And those are like six feet long and they're just the craziest looking things in the world. They're so cool, Uh, but they look very much like a hellbender. They're just triple the size, basically. It's pretty, pretty astounding. (laughs) 
Does anybody else have any questions before we wrap up for tonight? All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, we will have another lecture again um, in on the second uh, Monday. If you give me a moment, I can get the date for you. Uh, it'll be October. Sorry, wrong month. September 14th. Uh, again, you can register online just like you did for this one. Uh, we do have our full um, series lined up for the fall so you can see what the other topics that we're doing. Um, I will be sending out an email later this week with a link to this recorded presentation as well as the um, EE form if you need that attached. Um, I encourage you guys to join us again. We, thank you, Leslie, and I'm blanking on the name. Betsy? Betsy? Yeah. Betsy, okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> for joining us. Um, this has been great. I learned a lot. Um, and uh, everyone have a great evening. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us.